Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Constant Agitation, our weekly podcast. I'm uh, Jimmy, as always, joined by Eva. How are you doing? Good. Hi, guys. How's it going? Uh, can you hear me well? I don't know. I feel like we're lower than usual this time. I hear you here very well. I don't know how they're hearing you at home. All right. How is everybody doing in the chat? Thank you for joining us, as always. And if you're listening to the audio-only version, come have fun with us. Uh, on youtube it's yes. always fun and you can see the stuff we talk about as we talk about them uh what do we have planned for th today what do we have planned we have planned uh, showing out the work and the ideas of a very interesting person apart from uh, answering some of the questions that we got on social media but i think maybe it is time for introducing ourselves to our audience a bit. I don't think we have done like an introduction of who we are. I know some people know a little bit about us because they have been watching the videos in the channel before, perhaps. Yeah. But maybe we have new people that have not watched the videos or That's they true. don't really know what we're you might doing. Be thinking, who are these two talking Why? about? <laughs> Why am I listening to them? <laughs> well, you want to go ahead and um, tell us uh, who you are? Uh, yeah, sure. I can start. Um, as uh, some of you know, my name is Eva, Eva Garmendia, actually, that's my full name. I am originally from Spain, but I've been living in Sweden for quite some time. And uh, when it comes to photography, which I think what people might be most interested about, uh, mm -hmm. what I do, I have been interested in photography since very, very young. I know I have taken photos with my father when I was very young, even though I don't remember, but I know I have done it. And... Uh, a photography, I think, is one of the art forms that I remember feeling more attracted to since very early mm -hmm. on, going to museums and going to exhibitions. I was always, I was very much more attracted to look at photographs than some paintings, for example, uh, even though I enjoyed all of it. So with time, I got more interested and then I got really interested into analog photography mm -hmm. because of the arts and crafts part of it yeah. as well because and you also like like to have a tactile experience uh, experience yes but with like i know you like water painting as well yeah with the so color i like painting. using the brushes and all the materials different uh, papers yes and for a really long time i was working in the lab also mm -hmm. which i think it has a huge component of uh, undergoing what experiments kind of um so i am a microbiologist actually yeah. <laughs> so i did my phd studying bacteria and the revolution yeah. and before working with bacteria and evolution i work with grasshoppers in the lab as well mm -hmm. and with uh, some viruses so i've done different things but always working in the lab i've been very uh, much hands-on biologist yeah. so to speak and i've been i've been one time to the lab we, we were filming something yes and i got to see some i would say maybe like we can call it rudimentary work uh, like with the plating and yeah uh, it's, taking it, samples. it's even like painting even it's like you take samples that's you what put i wanted things, to yeah. say it was very involved with the hands and doing things with your hands so it was 
I kind of see this, like, I, it makes sense, this pattern you describe in, uh, in the interest that you have. Yeah, also, I feel like um, when I stopped working in the lab, so when I did my PhD and I finished, I decided that my, my professional career was not going to develop more in lab work base, lab, lab based work. Uh, I realized that I needed to do something with my hands. And then is when I resorted to starting watercolor painting and the use of the brush and the papers and the craft it really kind of I think um, stimulates a part of my brain that the lab used to do and that the chemical lab and the photo lab also does and the photography part so when it comes to photography uh, after learning self-taught myself a lot of things about photography uh, was more like a landscape or a non-people photographer <laughs> so mm -hmm. to speak and then a few years ago, I started to work with people taking portraits, taking life, what is called like lifestyle photography a bit. And it seems like people enjoy the experience of being photographed and spend some time with me creating uh, memories in form of images. So I've been doing that as well for the past uh, three years, I would say. Cool. Well, uh, about me, I'm going to try to keep it short. Yeah, sorry, uh, I went long. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, my name is Jimmy, or Jamil, but most people call me Jimmy because uh, Jamil was my grandpa. Mm -hmm. So uh, growing up, I was all called Jimmy and everybody is calling me that. But how did I get into photography? Well, i do not so sure. I just picked up a camera one day. I think it was the phone and I just enjoyed taking photos. But before that, I was raised in a family that does a lot of art as well, which is kind of... So... My family business is um, my parent, my father and my grandfather, they all work with uh, uh, interior design and uh, we make oriental um, decorative items and a lot of inter interior constructions. And so I was surrounded by that kind of like subconsciously taking it in all the time. And it's a lot of geometric work, a lot of patterns, a lot of cool things. Symmetries. Yeah, a lot really of different cool. materials. So growing up, I got to work with a lot of different materials. Uh. You can think of it as uh, carpentry work. Mm -hmm. I worked mostly with wood, even though we had worked with other materials, but it was more dangerous for me to be around the bigger tools mm -hmm. and to start learning with them. So, uh, yeah, I worked a lot with those materials, mother of pearl, uh, silver and gold and stuff like that. Ornamentary uh, yeah. thing. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, a, it's such a very, it's a very slow process of making something. Yes, you definitely. Know what I mean? Because you have the original design, but then you have to work with every separate material and treat it and then combine them together and do the final finish and then do the installation. So I think that for me is maybe related to why I like film because mm -hmm. I'm used to also, as you were mentioned, like this long hands-on process mm -hmm. and then you get the fruit of, at the end. Of yes, the, when I see the, the pieces that you, your family works with, they're like big, big puzzles, like... Yeah. You have like all these little pieces that go together and to create these patterns and it's really captivating. It is very much like puzzles in, 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 but that you have, you know, when, the, when you're making a puzzle, you have all the pieces and you put them together. Mm -hmm. Without work, you have to make the pieces and then, and put, then it put them together, <laughs> which is really cool. Laborious for sure. Yeah, it's really fun. And um, yeah, I think that's somehow has an effect on how I see photography and uh, unlike you, I'm not a big fan of taking photos of people, like for for client work. But I, I think that's something that I should be working on because I think it's a good attitude to always find your weaknesses and try to improve on them. But now that you know more about us, uh, 10 episodes in, <laughs> we finally introduce ourselves. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we can... Um, Maybe, uh, what do you think? We can start with the answering the questions. Yeah, uh, I think that should be that should be something we can do. So one question that I remember off the top of my head was, what are uh, good cameras um, bigger than 6x7? Right? That was the question, if I remember correctly. Yeah, what is a good camera that it has a format bigger than 6x7? All right. Um, the quick answer would be a 6x9. Or six by eight. There is a six. There is one six by eight camera that I can think of, uh, which is a Fuji six by eight. It's kind of like a um, a Mamiya RZ, but it's 
I think heavier and the lenses are heavier and the whole thing is heavier. I've heard some mixed opinions about it. Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, but then also, so with the six by seven line, you have so many different kinds. Mm -hmm. So you have the RB, RZ, and the uh, Bronicas, and you have all the Pentax. Yeah, and the Pentax, and you have the po portable uh, versions mm -hmm. like the Mamiya Seven and so on. Uh, I think there's uh, there's a Bronica that looks like a Mamiya Seven as well. I'm mm -hmm. not so sure, but so. If you want the um, equivalent of that, uh, but bigger, that would be the Fujis that are six by nines, mm -hmm. right? But you can also think about the large format cameras that take roll film. Mm. Yeah, like the um, Linkhoffs, for example, the and Linkhoff, the, the, those Grafica cameras. You mean the uh, Speed Graphics? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So these cameras, whatever you use a, a graph a graph lock. Uh, a graph lock bag if mm. it's a four by five camera they usually can take um a 120 roll film bag. some adapters yeah yeah i know there i've seen a horseman mm -hmm. uh 4a sure. or something like that that comes with a, uh, a graph lock bag that mm -hmm. is uh, 120, uh, 120 roll film and they do come in different sizes so they come in six by six six by seven six by nine and six, six by, by 12. twelve, yeah. And also, there are some Chinese, I think, made adapters on eBay <laughs> that uh, you can. What you basically do is, if you have, let's say, a Graphlock uh, back camera, a four by five, you can have a a whole back uh, with a viewing glass to convert it to six by uh, seventeen. Whoa, that's long. Yeah. That's panoramic. Yeah, and six by even six by twelve is panoramic, but six by seventeen is more panoramic and uh, with those you can take four shots basically on a roll of uh, of uh, 120, 120. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah if you want to if, if portability is not an issue for you you want to get very slow <coughs> excuse me you can go with something like a four by five hybrid or you can just go four by five and eight by ten and <laughs> all these big nice things uh, the benefit of that is that you have absolute control uh, especially if you get a camera with all the movements mm -hmm. Uh, so you can have your tilt and shift and swing and rise and fall, which is really fun to play with. But as I said earlier, if you want something on the go, you know, my one of my favorite cameras is the Fuji GW690 Mark III is yes. the one that I have. But I'm sure the Mark II and Mark I is just as good because these cameras were basically... Uh, all mechanical there is yeah. no light meter there is nothing to go wrong and some of the sharpest photos i've seen the they've lenses been taken are with beautiful. it it's like stuck sharp yeah so good yeah and it, so quick to use with the range finder everything i really like that camera yeah. so that i hope that answers the question uh the second question was uh about fuji pro 160 ns yep you mentioned that if you want it, go and get it before the prices, before oh, Fuji they stop yeah, they stop making it, it. And the <laughs> prices go crazy. Uh, for that, we got a question if it's worth it for people outside of Asia to pay extra to get that film. Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, do you really like the results you get from Fuji? Do you really enjoy Fuji uh, film? And also, how do you feel about editing your photos? It all depends on your process. Are you printing? Are you not printing? If you are printing uh, directly, like w w what I mean by printing is doing uh, a darkroom that work. Uh, mm -hmm. work. So basically using an enlarger mm -hmm. to project your photo on the paper directly and uh, getting a print that way. Then if you want to have the Fuji look, yes, I guess that's the only option you have in 120. If not, I think there's plenty of I mean, by plenty, I mean there's <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, there's plenty of uh, options, maybe not. So here's the thing. I did a shoot uh, recently, and I talked about this before. Mm -hmm. It was my first shoot with a one of my first shoots in years of a client, basically. And I shot both. It was a very sunny day. I shot both Portra 160 and Fuji 160. They do look different. But I can assure you with some editing, I can make them look exactly the same. Uh, yeah, like this is what we were talking last time, right? That 
with some effort you can do a lot of things with a lot of different uh, stocks and almost get them to look similar yeah i think it's more as you were saying if you are going to print directly if you're gonna take it to a lab and you're gonna get photos directly from it like then i would say yeah go with it and and try also i guess what i can say to people is get one roll and try maybe you love it and you want to get more of it yeah i mean i haven't necessarily uh nitpicked you know like went deep in the comparison they just looked like similar photos the colors are a bit different you know you get fuji colors versus portrait colors that your shadows are gonna diff look different your uh, main colors are gonna render like yeah. subtly differently the undertones are different yeah, yeah. The, the casts and the, the color casts are different yeah. in the film uh, but again you can just add layers in photoshop to make them look the same i mean yeah if you're gonna pay so much more money to get something that is you know that's your like i mean that's a tough decision to make for someone uh so yeah it all matters i don't think it's worth it if it's too much depending on where you are mm -hmm. uh but if you can get it with a good price go for it definitely and it's certainly cheaper than 400h i mean right now definitely <laughs> yeah i mean 400h basically doesn't exist anymore yeah uh all right I think that answers the questions. Was there anything else that I might have missed? Uh, no, I just went last minute to see if there's any other questions. I didn't see anything. So I guess no. Uh, we also actually said that we will cover or at least give out the news that the uh, camera rescue survey. Yeah, I tried looking for the link. Uh, you said you sent me. Where did you send it? I was in the other Trello board uh, okay. for the episode. It's okay. Can you uh, send it to me so yeah. I can put it on the screen? Sure. Uh let me see so what yeah. eva is talking about camera rescue is a organization in finland uh, that they have a mission to uh, to uh, basically rescue all the old film cameras and <laughs> in the world uh, yeah and service them i think they wanted to do like a thousand or a hundred thousand uh, a hundred thousand by the end of 2020 yeah. and they finished with 80s Five thousand, I think, which is not bad, uh, and uh, they're doing a very cool thing, uh, actually. The recent thing, yeah. yeah. They're doing. If you're interested in learning uh, how to fix these old cameras, mm -hmm. because uh, oh, sorry about that. It's okay. Um, if you're interested to learn about how to fix these cameras, maybe learn and work as a camera repairman or woman repair person. <laughs> um you can uh, get in contact with camera rescue they're doing these uh, what do you call them uh they call them re repair it's a, it's a repair um a school yeah so basically they're um uh, teaching people they do have uh, they if you go to the website it's called B camera rescue school they're yeah. gonna call it so ba so basically the thing with camera rescue is that uh, it's a two things kind is one or how do you say like how do you differentiate between camera rescue and camera camera store tor or camera cameratory yeah. cameratory yeah so in finland camera store has been a, a photo store for a really long time and mm. then they it's like kind of like a spin-off mm. and it's been a bit of a debate are they really related even though it's a spin-off do they actually use camera store to sell out the cameras they repair through camera rescue or not yeah. so i do think they're very involved with each other i think it's it's man it's managed and, r and run by the same people yes. some people might be involved in one project and not in the other and so on but basically it's the same group of people working with these two projects yes. uh, that might involve or not other people in one and not exactly. the other so if you go to their website, you can see that they offer camera, uh, camera store I'm talking about. They do uh, offer uh, camera service, servicing and repair. And I went on the website and you see they have different people who have expertise in different camera brands, bodies and yeah. camera mm -hmm. brands. Yeah. And so I think um, as far as I understand from the news is that you, can, you will work with these experts mm -hmm. and learn about the specific cameras that you want to uh, learn about. It's very cool. If you're interested in learning how to repair camera, check them out. Um, and yeah, let's, should we keep the survey to the end? Because yeah, I really want to talk about uh, our uh, It's one of my fav personal favorites, the photographer of today. Yes. Okay. Let's do that. And then we go back to it. Maybe we can show some of the... All right so here we go 
Um, let's jump into this. Yes, so today's artist, I'm going to just call him artist because I don't want to label him as a one specific art. Yeah, he's definitely not a photographer or one other thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, we are going to talk about him because you really wanted to bring him up because mm -hmm. you've been very attracted by his art for a long time. Yes. So maybe we can start telling us, you can tell us why do you like so much the work that he does? Yeah, well... I, here's the thing, I always, when I was taking photos, I remember when I wanted to learn more about um, composition and different angles, I remember watching one of Ted Forbes' videos, mm -hmm. and he was talking about uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, and there was this photo by Henri Cartier-Bresson where he's, there's a politician giving a speech to a big group of people. Mm -hmm. Actually, I can pull that photo up. And so, uh, Henri, how do you type? Henri, Henri. Uh, Cartier, Bresson, uh, politician. Yeah, I think it should come up as. I saw okay. the first one. So, yeah, this photo. So I was looking at this photo by Henri Cartier Bresson, and he was, uh, Ted was, I, I'm pretty sure it was Ted Forbes. He was explaining on how what's cool about this photo is that how he positioned himself mm -hmm. in most photos. Uh, and that's like that's the photo he decided to choose to report on this event. Mm -hmm. In most photos, you would see a photo of the politician, maybe. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, Bresson decided to go behind him and show this unusual angle of the masses. Mm. I mean... And remember, like, this is an old photo. And, like, maybe you've seen Metallica live somewhere and you've seen similar angles. But that's a different thing. And that's a video of a concert that you're getting multiple different angles. Mm -hmm. But for a photog photographer to choose one photo, to, this is, a, I think, it's an unusual uh, take, take. take yeah. on mm -hmm. it. And you see it's back focused. So the focus is on the crowd mm -hmm. rather on the, on the person himself mm -hmm. uh, who's giving the speech. And that kind of got stuck in my head mm -hmm. and I wanted to always look for unusual angles. Do you know what I mean? I yes. always wanted to, <laughs> and I, I, it kind of opened my mind to taking weird photos. Like if, if you know you're, it's afternoon, you've had a big lunch and you're lying down and your head is like falling off the couch, maybe <laughs> it's just like a fat cat, you can't move <laughs> and you will see the world in a angle that you're unusually looking from. Mm -hmm. from a new perspective and and then when i stumbled upon rochenko's work basically all of his work like 90 percent of his work was from angles like that super weird angles right? actually when you read about rochenko and you uh, read about his work as a photographer which was later in his life that's the definition of it is like and he was interviewed about it many times you know about like what is it that you do in photography or why do you work the way you do? And he would... Uh, oh, artsy. It's giving errors, oh. I think. Uh, he would mention things like... Um, I actually put up some quotes. Um, he said, for example, one has to take several different shots of a subject from different points of view and in different situations as if one examined it in the round rather than look through the same keyhole again and again. So for him, and we can talk about this a little bit more, he saw photography as a service. So he saw photography not only perhaps as an art, but also as showing people something that they were not able to see generally. And that, and he really focused on doing that by choosing the weirdest angles or the positions where you, you at the beginning, you are not recognizing what you're seeing. You had to like stop and it's like, oh, where is this? Or maybe this from this other angle, which... It's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, like we can look at the photo. That this is one of the first photos I've seen by uh, Alexander. Mm -hmm. And I mean, wh who takes <laughs> who takes a photo like this? Like he's basically, it feels like he must be touching the guy and like you know, it's like leaning <laughs> on him or maybe you know stabbing <laughs> him with the camera to get such an angle. I mean, you need to get the focus right though. Also, I mean, you know, so if you think about like how was this photo taken? <laughs> 
right so many so much of his work i find very 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 i think there is another link that has more photography this one has more a graphic yeah i think it was this one that decided to the artsy one yeah uh yeah actually the artsy one is the one that has more and i think their website is down right now oh yeah i cannot open it either yeah so that's a very timely (laughs) um, this is the problem of the live (laughs) I think oh no no yeah error occur it's not yeah, working uh, the, okay let's see if I have any other links so uh, that's unfortunate indeed we can look here in the Google search oh yeah um, and look at these images and okay let's give a little bit of background why don't we uh, before he was a photographer. Mm-hmm. He was a painter. Yes, that's the first main art that he mastered and he worked on. Uh, he okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this uh, like segment mm-hmm. that you uh, kept in uh, in uh, Trello. Mm-hmm. Okay, so in the years before Russian Revolution of 1917, uh, they leased. Okay, so this is a personal thing. You wanted to talk that he leased an apartment in Moscow owned by uh, <laughs> Vasily Kad- Kandinsky. I only like, uh, yeah, I kind of like poured some interesting things because Kandinsky is one of my favorite painters. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a bit earlier generation than uh, Rodchenko. And uh, uh, this kind of like this, I mean, it's like gossip or stuff, but like to think that these people knew each other and yeah. that they were like, you know, one was the landlord of the other one. I, th- I think it was a similar thing in, uh, <laughs> what was it, Vivian Mayer? Oh yeah, yeah. Episode. With she <laughs> that, she lived in the in the same building as the uh, one other very famous photographer. Yeah. Um, da, da, da. So yeah, Kandinsky. I really love Kandinsky. Is one of the pioneers of abstract art. I'm really attracted to abstract art and especially abstract paintings. So I was like, oh, and you can see a lot of the same uh, tendencies in color choosing and in uh, shapes and in forms and uh, on Rochenko early paintings as mm-hmm. well. So he spent a lot of time painting. Such as this one, basically. Yeah, I think this is from the later times. So if you go to the other link, I think that we were this looking one. into. Yeah, so you see those ones, the the ones that are like this circles. This one is definitely inspired by... Uh, yes, and the choice of colors and uh, the shapes, you know, these circles, one uh, concircular to another, um, a lot of primary colors. All this is also very Kandinsky-like, um, Russian abstract art and this is the earlier work and apparently he worked for a long time on painting and then one day he basically decided that he had explored and come down to the absolute conclusion of painting and it was the end of it (laughs) that's basically that's literally what he said (laughs) right uh i think i left you a quote there on the trello as well about this particular thing as yeah, early as 1921, uh, R- yeah. Rochenko had declared the death of a, of painting in 1921 with three monochrome uh, paintings, pure red color, pure yellow color, and a pure blue color, mm-hmm. exhibited in the exhibition 5x5, five five, um, I don't know what the measurement Equals 25. Equals 25, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's the name of the ex- exhibition. Yeah, that's the name five, of the exhibition. 5x5 five yeah. five equals 25. And uh, he said, quote, I reduced painting to its logical conclusion and exhibited three canvases, red, blue, y- and yellow. He declared, I affirmed it's all over. Basic colors, every plane is a plane, and there's to be no more representation. So that's the overall conclusion. And he never painted again from that moment. That was it. Those they were like the epitome of his uh, work as a painter. He presented three canvases of pure color pure pigment mm-hmm. it's like this is the basic of it and i am not to be part of this any longer that's it <laughs> that's the death of art of, of painting yeah he dropped the, pr- the brush yeah he dropped it forever and after that uh, it's kind of it's so interesting right like these ideas of like yeah this is i've been i've been going so deep into this this is the base of it and there's nothing else i can learn from it in a sense I'm dropping this. I'm not going into this anymore. And after that, he focused more on the, um, doing things with like 3D representation. So I know he had a part of working with big 
um, wooden pieces put together in big rooms and stuff like that, more on the artistic side in a sense. And after that, he took on photography quite a lot and that's why he became also a, a famous photographer. And I think this is the time by where where he um, he defined and started what is called the con constructivism art. Yeah, I think uh, here I'm looking at it, it's um, um, Rochenko turned his attention to merging art with life mm -hmm. and that because he was one of the um, founders of the constructivist yeah there um, was there's a, it's a talk that is two people that were the right. ones that started it yeah so um which okay so uh he became a founding member of the constructivist working uh group in 1921 mm -hmm. which defined art making as a form of professional expertise and labor like any other work and not as a spiritual calling uh, period using the materials and tools of an architect or an engineer such as a compass ruler and plywood he produced a series of spatial constructions uh, in 1921 which uh, were hung suspended from the ceiling with these circular structures he abandoned the premise of traditional sculpture uh, such as mass pedest pedestal mm -hmm. and uh, uh, precious materials uh, in favor of open volume made with from everyday materials like wire and plywood a special construct spatial construction constructions were included alongside works by the leading constructivist artists such as uh, i'm gonna butcher the name uh, karel loganson mm -hmm. georgie and vladimir stenberg Stenb mm -hmm. stenberg my swedish pronunciation is <laughs> seeping into these <laughs> names uh, and Konstantin Medunsky mm -hmm. uh, in an exhibition organized by Omo Omo <laughs> it's such a weird <laughs> acronym I don't know by these people somebody yeah. in Moscow in May of 1921 between 1920 and 1930 Rochenko taught construction and metalwork at another Russian organization that I'm no, impossible no. to pronounce <laughs> um, which was the Russian equivalent of the German Bauhaus. Bauhaus. Yeah, I was actually going to bring up Bauhaus right now because the Bauhaus art of thought and architecture was pretty much also on on the idea that functional things can be artful in a sense. So there's a put a lot of 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 thought into into making functional things, but that that they are artful, like architecture and. Uh, con interior design and stuff like that so so there are like two things here um with the constructivism and rochenko going in from painting into these more uh, structures and and making things that are useful i think they they try to so art <laughs> this is like it's very interesting because yesterday i went into like a rabbit hole after reading about this constructivism and then I somehow ended up in a page that was talking about anti-art which is also related you know, to Dadaism so Dadaism was another art line that was trying to be everything opposite to what art has been till that moment mm -hmm. so kind of like a revolutionary thing and but you know like and then I started in my head but okay so can we maybe start from the beginning of what is art what does it mean that something is art or it doesn't art that's artists be before people define it as art right like yeah. so it, so <laughs> <laughs> right i can't help you there <laughs> i mean no these are very philosophical discussions yeah. and i was i was uh, reading about aesthetics you know like the the philosophy um, sa the philosophy um uh, how you say philosophy branch that mm -hmm. is called aesthetics that it deals with understanding how art like pleases the senses and how art is judged but it's a bit diff different from philosophy of art because philosophy of art looks into other things mm -hmm. so all these things are very inter in interrelated i think aesthetics is very interesting because it's about how uh, we were talking about this how culture or the the happenings that are occurring around you shape art and 
the other way around, art shapes what's happening around. So aesthetics is, is basically studying all these things. And it, it's very interesting reads, it's very deep and it's mind boggling what you, where you can go with that. But it was very interesting to read this, the path that, that Rochenko had and how all these things were happening in parallel in Europe or like, you know, Russia and then you have the German Bauhaus as well, that they were trying to, okay, maybe art should not just be something to look at and be pretty and make your your sense of looking so nice you know and make you feel good but it could be also be something functional that we can live exactly i mean when you look at these posters that have been it was known that this um the constructivist uh, art was directly influencing the propaganda of the revolution as well mm -hmm. and you're looking at these posters these are beautiful beautifully made posters and I don't know how they looked like before. I mean, it's interesting to see how, what preceded this uh, this design language. Mm -hmm. Do you mean the art that was used for advertising or propaganda? Yeah. I think that maybe they, it didn't exist as a thing. I, I'm sure it existed in one form of, or another, but you can see the relation here in kind of like how it is that you remove art from being something mystical or spiritual to make it something useful just like a profession and you think of it that's like basically what makes a graphic designer a thing yeah and you see the relation here even though these um photos in the beginning of this gallery are very abstract mm -hmm. but when you go and uh, look more about this you these these artists basically what they did they used as i mentioned they used materials mm -hmm. and tools to create this art that were not very conventional in the sense that we talked about it before when we discussed camera obscura yeah that was a tool basically mm -hmm. uh, to help you draw yeah right so mm -hmm. basically a camera obscura for those of you who missed the episode is a box with a lens or a pinhole mm -hmm. on one side and the light goes through and projects inside right yeah. usually with a normal camera it's a photosensitive material but it was also used for painting where the painter would sit inside the box um, yeah. and have a, let's say, a, a, what do you call it? Calc paper or like a tracing paper? Yeah, like paper. tracing paper. Mm -hmm. And the image will be projected on the paper and, then the and the artist will trace it uh, with a pencil or something. Yeah, and use it for further painting. Yeah, exactly. so it's a tool. And then it was used differently. Yeah, yeah, and basically, it's basically where the camera comes from. Yes. Um, <laughs> but here, with these people, they used... Uh, compasses yeah and different building materials, materials. also yeah. there were some like when you look at modern art and you see these um, canvases of just one <laughs> color or two colors <laughs> basically these guys were doing it in the 20s and uh, early on mm -hmm. they were doing just different canvas material laid on top of each other uh, there was another artist that i can't remember the name of while researching this um, a lot of collages and a lot of this kind of like so uh, he had a canvas of white canvas with a different white yeah square laid on just like up to the corner and tilted on a very odd angle uh -huh. not a right angle of any sort uh -huh. and uh, then uh, Rochenko re uh, responded to that piece with a black on black uh -huh. so white on white black on black and all these different things and um, also you can see that the like for example this one i really loved love this one um it's the titled objectless composition mm -hmm. it is just a, a basically a collage of different planes mm -hmm. in 3d space and it really gives depth to this to this like it's just a bunch of lines but it in a in a sense i don't think it needs anything more mm -hmm. it's just so beautiful the way it is and I can't explain to you why I like it, yeah, but right. it, there, I think there is something to uh, maybe to show or to express what you can do with the tools that you have in a different way. Yeah. And I think that then that type of design and that type of abstract shape mm -hmm. and you like just learning on how to make a pleasing um composition to the eye mm -hmm. that is not based on anything of beauty or aesthetic i don't know it's just pieces yeah it's just very pleasing 
and I'm not sure why. <laughs> Isn't we... that the, like all, all abstract art is like, why do we like it? Is the rhythm? Is it like the color palette? Is it the compositional uh, situation? Well, there's definitely rhythm. Yeah. And those things. I, I think that, to be honest, like these, these artists, uh, Kandinsky and Rochenko and all these uh, abstract, the Russians and the Germans, the, 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 the way they treat color to me is just like, it is their strength. Of course, the shapes and stuff is also good, but the way that they work with the color. And actually, this is something I didn't know. And I, because yesterday I went into the also line of like looking back at Kandinsky's work and maybe learning a bit of like how did he end up doing the amazing work he did. And uh, Kandinsky got amazed by a Monet painting because he was looking into it, like he explained that he was looking into that painting and he couldn't recognize what the subject was. The only thing he could see was color. Mm -hmm. He said, I had to read the title to realize there were haystacks. And it's a very famous, famous painting by Monet, the Haystacks uh, series. He was like, I was so taken by the color choice and the colors that I it took me time to realize what is it that I'm looking at. And this is what, uh, the Haystacks, that one here. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is what I, it, it has taken me aback and I want to work with this and I want to focus on color and this is what he basically did his, his career on. This, the choice of colors in Kandinsky's work is amazing. I absolutely agree and I think what I wanted to, like where I was going with my very long and, uh, <laughs> you know, analogy that is scattered is that you can see how that kind of played into this into the the uh, graphic art that the they work after yeah you see what i mean and then what's so beautiful about R rochenko is that he took all of that mm -hmm. and put it into his photography yes you know like a, a piece like this one for example a photograph like this one mm -hmm. it's just basically rhythm and shape yes you know what I mean? I think he, he basically treated the elements in his pictures the same way he would treat the, the different shapes that he would put in his propaganda work or in his uh, early abstract work of, of painting as well. Yeah. I mean, like this one, for example, you look at it and it just looks like it could be the elements of a poster. The art ceiling, by the way, is working again. Cool. Yes, yeah, so you know. Yes, exactly. That's what I mean. It's like it, it is photography, but it could be abstracted from the fact that it was taken with a camera. It doesn't matter. What it matters is the position of the elements and how they relate to each other, which is the same thing that he worked with in his uh, posters. The posters are amazing. The choice of colors are amazing. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at this one. This one is so cool. Very yeah. nice. Um, it's it's completely reduced to the like to the bare minimum basically mm -hmm. and uh, you can look at this for inspiration for so much different work in terms of architecture in terms of an interior design in terms of um a minimalism art minimalistic art something like this it is just so beautiful i don't i can't tell you why but the ability of showing so many different planes with s simple lines and as you say the implementation of these colors is just masterful and i feel like th this you can um i mean as rochenko showed us that you can take this and do so much with it with your photography mm -hmm. um, i i i'm always amazed at these ar abstract artists because I think like being a, a good, successful and a proper abstract artist is incredibly difficult. I think it's even more, I dare to say that it's even more difficult than being an artist that does something like realism. Because I think being a, an artist that represents the reality, you have the reality there. You, you copy it, you will learn the skills. Yeah, the skills are difficult, right? Mm -hmm. But once you have the skills, you have the thing there for you to to see it, to get inspired and to represent it. It's like copying. But with abstract art, everything 
is a possibility. The, there is no mold for you to follow. And in order to create things that work and things that are beautiful and things that are attractive, mm -hmm. is so hard. Yeah. Uh, this one that we're looking at right now, it's a photo um, of what it seems like tram, a tramway tracks. Yeah. And a bunch of people walking. There's two cars in the corner. This kind of reminds, reminds me of some of... Uh, Fun Ho. I yeah. was just thinking about it, yeah. Right? But again, here you can see the relation between uh, between Alexander's work with the with the one we were just looking at, with the lines, mm -hmm. with the yellow lines on a On the orange. red, yeah. Mm -hmm. And here, you can see how the lines of the tram and the wires and that electrical pole, they're, cre they're kind of highlighting these different planes mm -hmm. in space mm -hmm. very geometrical work very nice and i don't i know i understand like you could look at this photo and you can be like what is this it's just a tilted photo <laughs> nothing you, I'm, i'm sure you can show it to some people and they'll be like snapshot what is this <laughs> <laughs> this this artist this <laughs> photograph was taken by an idiot who doesn't know how to operate the camera but which is stupid uh but uh yeah i mean it, the other thing that you i i need to point out that i feel about this is balance yeah is the balance of weight and space and we ex talked a lot about this in fan ho's episode mm -hmm. Uh, how to use space how to use negative space B because when it, well, there's the rule of negative space where it's like you isolate your, your subject and you use the negative space to do something or bring it to, up to, or to play with the weight it, yeah. mm -hmm. but the rule of space dropping the negative word is using the rest of the space to highlight something mm -hmm. and when it comes to this abstract photo it's just on such a different level that is so open to interpretation and i don't know how to necessarily describe or know but i know that i really enjoy it and that pole the placement of the pole it kind of balances everything out in a way that i don't understand like if you look at this There's a traffic light over here on mm -hmm. the bottom and it's playing with these shapes over here. Yeah. Creating dimensions. And then you have this one cutting through everything with another one over here mm -hmm. and a bunch of people here. It's just, I don't know. I'm just such a big fan of this photo and I don't know how to articulate. <laughs> I mean, sometimes sometimes things don't need to be um, articulated. I'm I'm a bit surprised. I have to say, because knowing that uh, Rochenko moved from painting into other adventures because he felt like art should be more than just aesthetic pleasing and serve a purpose. His photography, some of it is very photojournalistic type of thing, which, yeah, it serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. But other photography, like the one you just show, it's just something to enjoy. I think maybe he didn't see it the same way, you know, maybe he saw it as we were saying, he wanted to provide a new angle, which would be a new way of, of seeing and thinking for the viewer. And it would serve that purpose that would make them think and use their brains. Maybe that's what he was after, I guess. I'm not sure. I wish I could talk to him and ask him. Right. Uh, but uh, again, here we see another example of playing with the with the planes, because now it's it feels like. I'm almost looking at a wall with cars driving on top of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you just imagine it, it's just it's so nice to see this. It's so refreshing in a way to see somebody having the courage to try something that is beautiful. Without, I mean, it's inspiring for me. It's inspiring mm -hmm. that this work is appreciated because. It, There's so much staleness nowadays, I feel like, with oh. a lot of the popular work. I'm such a downer. I keep going back to this thing. <laughs> But, um, like, there's 
there to try new things mm -hmm. you know what i mean play with whatever you have and don't get hung up on yeah I mean, all of these things th the thing is that when looking up a work like the rochenko's work you need to also place it in the right time like when was this work produced and okay. what does it meant that it was being produced it was this was a kind of photography that not a lot of people were doing in the, the 20s on the 30s or you have the crazy people like man ray as well and all that that they were this uh, this is what we use in the in the thumbnail like avant-garde is mm -hmm. is this forward way of thinking which is like how can we look at things in a different angle how can we use different tools that we never used before to do something specific is this like being outside of the box all the time mm -hmm. and this is what makes the difference about this photography you were saying yeah now this photography you put it to someone someone's gonna say snapshot not understanding what it could be meaning right but here's my question does it does does it like does the fact of it being avant-garde being uh, you know like right at the tip of the spear of what is happening right now mm -hmm. and does it does that add value to it in a, in a way or does it or does looking back at it now makes it more a hundred years later oh. looking back a hundred years and thinking a hundred years from now uh, back in the in the past there was these artists who were doing something that has not been done before is that what it what gives it value i mean it's, it's i wish cool. it's cool to know that yeah, about yeah, it yeah. but here's the thing i wish i would know it, it, here's the thing a hundred or i don't know how many years from now back in the past yeah somebody invented a car and now we're still using a car and car and you know life without cars is tr is hard to imagine you know like all of the things that people came up with at some point um, are appreciated and used mm. and continue to develop mm. right right so how why uh, why is some of the art is neglected in such a way you know i mean mm -hmm. is in the public eye yeah That's well uh, this is a psychological thing right like a psychological take on it i think there might be many reasons i have not studied psychology but i could think that you know that we humans are kind of reluctant to change or at least on when you pull the human populace you know like everyone as as a group People tend to not like change and tend to not understand when people act or behave in a different way out of the norm. And this is built into our psychology because something that is different from us used to be a, a threat, right? Mm -hmm. And this is how we, we are inbuilt. Things that are different, people that act differently, people that don't follow the norms, we perceive them as threat by like our instinct is to perceive them like that. And I think maybe that also applies to how people take on new art or n new ways of making art, mm. right? Could be something like that. Well, some interesting uh, comments in the, shot, uh, in the chat. The CM is saying, I believe that the angle and strange perspectives has partly to do with the new film format, 35 millimeter, mm -hmm. and the way portable Leica uh, that Rochenko used not the old large format plate cameras. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's definitely a good point that it allowed uh, that the technology the, of the time always allows for a certain thing. And now we see the rise of like video editing and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Uh, the ability uh, to get footage that we were not able to do before, mm -hmm. you know, with like the small, um, with the drones, for example, and with the uh, with the uh, like GoPro type cameras that you can be mounted anywhere. Yeah. Like on the SpaceX rockets and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even we got footage from Mars, you know, which is I under I I understand that. But uh, and that can be all actually like a very constructive uh, view on a topic. Um, let's see. Uh, da da da. Uh, Cedric is also saying that photography has been democratized to an extreme. So now we're over flooded, basically. Mm -hmm. with, I think also we talked about this in one of the earlier episodes, is that there is so much to sift through. Yeah. And um, 
the Are... amount of uh, material that is being created every day <laughs> right it's much more than before yeah that's true but there is also i feel like there is a a kind of um yeah but that 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 should make it that should make does that muddy the water to the point that we don't even know what we're looking at anymore uh, you know like how does that affect anything i'm sure back in the day there was a lot of people still shooting mm-hmm. you know and even uh, even with the like fun ho was shooting 120 so he wasn't he was using yeah, a, a relatively TLR, por- yeah. portable tlr and he did similar work in some sense but he was interested in making different stuff um the 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 difference we see with Rochenko is very focused on the geometric Extremes, and shapes yeah. like with this one that we're looking at right now we have the diagonal symmetry he's the master of the dutch angle yeah <laughs> definitely he has a lot of the, uh, these cool things um let's see because the picture is necessarily breathtaking anymore uh uh, Th- Cedric is bringing out a point where I think is it's worth mentioning. You know that he was saying the uh, democratizing of uh, photography because everyone has now access to tools that can create photography, so to speak, mm. and that there is a lot of uh, skill building around photography in the amateurish. This is something that is not something new. I think we were reading a book some time ago. Um, yeah, when we were talking about Imogen and the Group Sixty Four, there were some people already back then that they were saying that the amateur photographer would be able to do better work than the professional because they had the time to experiment and do things that the professional might not have. Mm-hmm. This is what they were talking about. And uh, Cedric is seeing that uh, I don't know, he mentions like some hobbyists surpass yesterday masters when it comes to maybe skills. But I don't think they should sp- they surpass yesterday's masters on the way of thinking about what they're doing and trying to to... So just because one person today has better skills than in one aspect than Cartier-Bresson, let's say, yeah, whatever, but how, whatever. How do you how do you separate skills from. from the tools? Yeah, I know. You know, like how how is that that I don't think that's a fair comparison in a sense. If you can shoot, if you go if you can go out yeah. on a photo walk and take five thousand photos, yeah, yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. come back and work on them super easily with Photoshop. My my idea, my point is not about the technical ability. It's more about the the choice. No, exactly. This is what I meant. That just because a person has a better technical ability than an old master doesn't mean that he's going to be equally good at making the right choices to create the art. Mm-hmm. You know, this is what I mean. That just because you have a digital camera that can take a much higher resolution picture than the 35 millimeter M3 Leica that uh, Cartier-Bresson had, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that you might be making the better or better choices when it comes to creating a photo an image you know because yeah, but, it's much more than that but then we go back into like uh, subjectivity and yeah. what do you think versus what i think is good i mean like for me for example um we were recently looking about which is a, a future it's going to be a future episode about kuhn who did a lot of work with um uh, autochrome mm-hmm. uh, color process yeah um i really like there is nothing that i've seen in recent work that i enjoy the colors at the same amount as the work of the uh, the look of autochrome yeah the way that stuff look the colors that renders from that process and there are new processes that can recreate that work and you can probably match it somehow but I don't see it. Yeah. It's not anywhere. I don't see that that look of the autochrome. And uh, I feel like there is something about the choice. It's not just about... So when, when the autochrome process, when Kuhn was making his own plates mm-hmm. and coming up with these colors, yeah, he made a choice to stop there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like this is the mix that I like. This is the color, color that I want. That get. I want to mm-hmm. get, and he worked with it. Mm-hmm. Now we have 
all the different options and so easily accessible to make your photos look any color you want. Mm -hmm. any and color I grading, still yeah. see a overwhelming amount of horrendous color. Color gradings. Yeah, this is actually it's a, it's a good point that you're bringing up that even though we have a lot of possibilities, but yeah, I mean, having in account first and foremost that color choice is personal like I what know. you might but it, it it is an interesting topic that we don't see represented some kind of the things that were done in the past that i think they are pretty and they are very enjoyable in in photography for example yeah and i, I mean look i i might like maybe i sound too grim <laughs> but i am not uh, i'm actually very hopeful and i see a lot of really good work with the people working nowadays mm -hmm. it's just uh, i wish they were more popular you know like uh, some of them are very popular but when i see the and i think this is a this is a futile uh, <laughs> argument because yeah. like one some all the most popular things are the least masterful things yeah and i, I mean then we get also in the realm of discussing like how does uh, an artist become popular artist and i think it today it is not at all like it was yesterday and also i don't know how many people in the 50s were trying to be photographers and were doing work for themselves and they were worthy to also be um popular in a sense look at the uh, vivian mayer we were talking she shot so much she never really tried to be popular or do anything with it and her work is masterful mm -hmm. how many people did we miss that we are equally gonna miss of the people that are working on right now because they don't get the, the exposure yeah. or the spotlight you know i agree yeah how did we get on this topic <laughs> i don't know i i just think that um i wanted to say something about this um point of the uh, you know the the abundance and uh, we talked about this again in a previous episode that me saying this sentence so many times it feels like we're repeating ourselves <laughs> <laughs> we should change the topic but i feel like it's um it's important to if you are someone who is uh, passionate and want to learn and want to get better i want your work to be taken more seriously than a uh, amount of likes on instagram yeah um don't learn it the the current way of the like don't just think that you have to buy this camera and uh, buy this preset pack mm -hmm. and you know just avoid presets in general make your own which is it's really fun yeah. you know because making your own presets is basically you know developing your own style mm -hmm. yep. and so experiment with that it's so easy as was mentioned by cedric is that you anybody can do it you don't need to have a you know, complicated uh, chemistry, um, you know, or... Access to tools or something. Yeah, yeah. because with Kuhn, he was basically making his own film-sensitive material. And we know somebody in uh, one chat group that is working on that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, if he succeed, uh, he or she, I'm, not, I'm still not sure. <laughs> but if they succeed with that process, we would love to share their work Yes. Uh, on uh, with you guys, uh, because it, I think is is fascinating and i don't think they're necessarily trying to copy kuhn i think they're gonna have their own look yeah of course and this is the ultimate color grading in analog photography yeah. here. <laughs> for those of you who don't know what we're talking about uh, autochrome is just a a piece a plate of glass that you put photosensitive material on and then you shoot it with a camera develop it and that piece of glass will be your kind of like slide um your photo. master's photo yeah yeah it's kind of like a kodachrome uh not kodak or kodachrome or ectachrome four by five basically yeah but it's, it's, it's made of glass yeah um but yeah let's jump back to uh alexander's work uh here i really like this photo um this is a pioneer girl uh do you know what that means do you what pioneer do yeah you, i do did, did you have pioneers in spain yeah, I mean, we it's the same word, pionero, uh, in Spanish. Uh, actually, you said this is a pioneer girl. You know who this photo reminds me of? Mm -hmm. uh, Greta Thunberg. 
<laughs> she does kind of, yeah, yeah. She <laughs> Which does. is also a pioneer of sorts, sort of thing. So I think uh, the stance and the angle is a very important thing when it conveying what the subject is. I really like this because this is a photo. You, you, you probably know this. If you're taking a photo of someone, the angle change will change the feeling you get on uh, coming from the subject. Mm -hmm. So if you take a photo from the top, you make them look smaller, not necessarily in size, but in demeanor. And the opposite is true. When you take the photo from below, you make them seem grander. Mm -hmm, bigger. And um, I feel like this is a very fitting photo of the, you know, 1930s in Russia. And the, and the, but the, instead of a big politician or a, it's a pioneer girl. Yeah. I think it's a, it's unusual to kind of highlight uh, somebody like that in such a manner. Mm hmm um here again the one i had o earlier the one with the what do you call these are they gymnasts? Cheer cheerleaders or Gymnast? gymnasts uh doing these shapes isolating them in that moment and kind of like mm -hmm. cropping the one in the front makes them turn into more like uh, uh sh just shapes rather than documenting People, yeah. the uh, and it's still documenting the the event happening mm -hmm. it's just i feel it's a much more uh, pleasing uh, image to look at mm -hmm. in a sense here we see also a similar uh, thing happening with the gymnast on the floor mm -hmm. these very cropped angles that are very <laughs> unusual nowadays with the drones we've seen a lot of similar photos to this one from the sky from yeah. the sky with the shadow play yeah uh, this is probably afternoon, low sun, mm -hmm. creating longer shadows. Uh, very, very cool. I think this is a cobblestone floor uh, or road. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, every time I open an image, when I go Oi. back, I lose my place. And uh, this one, this one, uh, you can't like not <laughs> see the resemblance of the posters in it. Yeah, exactly. You know, like the posters we were looking at earlier the with the triangles straight and straight lines. lines. Yeah. This is basically the same thing in a f in photo form. Very, very clear. Very cool. And here we see this photo that was r later used in this poster that I find absolutely beautiful. You know what I was thinking earlier, but we didn't have time to, to, uh, to do this. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure I wanted to ask you about it, but you were stuck in 7,000 meetings today. <laughs> Uh, but uh, this one, uh, I wanted to use this one as a thumbnail, oh. and kind of like change the to constant the, the agitation. To yeah, yeah, I think it would have been a cool representation. Maybe I would do it after the live. Uh, again, very very simple, but yet very. How do you say? Very simple, but very very like. Um, it's just what you need. There is it, nothing it, extra. Like you just look at it. Like I don't speak Russian. Yeah. But I see it and I already know what it means. What it means to you. You know, it's like it is calling for your attention. It's yeah. calling for your attention. It's like this broadcasting like, hey, you here. Like I don't need to understand the letters, right? Yeah. Because it's so uh, graphic in a it's sense, very right? Nice. Like. And I really like those lines and how they play with the dimension kind of. Because for me, I see this one projecting, but I see this one kind of like folding, like ah uh, into like this. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's really it's really cool. It, like it's a mix of the stairs with the woman photo. Like if you put that stairs photo into the side and then you put the woman this next one. to it, yeah, 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 yeah. It's basically <laughs> the same. It's the uh, two photos put together, but made in a graphic part. Very cool stuff. Let's see. This is the last page. If you're listening, we hope you found the links and yeah. you're taking a look. It's going to be hard to keep up because this is uh, sometimes gets uh, very messy. But, uh, oh, somebody is translation uh, translating uh, Russian. Miguel, thank you. Oh, nice. Um, book. Book. So it's a call for action to book something. Or is or it a books. book? Reading books. Read books. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. This is, uh, I really like this one of the swimmer jumping off the uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the jump board. I don't know what you call it, doing back flips or front flips. And you can see that he's over the, or she uh, mm -hmm. is over the, the clouds. 
Yes. Um, very, very nice composition. And it kind of like, you know, gives you this crazy feeling that they're flying or coming from outer space. There was another one. There was another one that I really like of a diver. There, this one. <laughs> <laughs> very crop. Interesting crop. Very interesting crop. And yeah, I mean, it's just very minimalistic, just isolating something that you want to highlight. Uh, and again, you kind of have this the same shape, the kind of like, what do you know, call it, trapezoid? Uh-huh, yeah. Is it like going like this? Uh, we have a bunch of work with the stairs. This one also is a famous one. Um, you can also feel the different dimensionality of the... I mean, to to the point of having the ability to do this work with a bigger camera i think it's i think it's definitely easier but it's not impossible to do it with something it is else. not but i i have to agree that yeah the portability and the back in the day super new sh small cameras it, it was a revolution in a, in a sense i mean it definitely like having 36 frames in a roll definitely allows you to go out Snap more, more and mm -hmm. you know you know uh, be more adventurous with your photographs rather than if you have a um i mean i see it you know like back in the days the photographers that only had like medium format and the four by five eight by ten and then the 35 millimeter came along it might have felt for them the same way we analog photographers feel about the digital shooters that go out and take thousand photos in a day <laughs> yeah. you know like the, the relationship to it is is very much like oh wow you can do anything you want you can just shoot and shoot and shoot and try <laughs> uh miguel is uh, providing us with the russian translation Good thank you uh <laughs> it's about reading it's not about booking uh yeah <laughs> cool um this one is so cool as well the one mm -hmm. with the glasses um well, I want to say something. I found another color uh, choice Option, of this one. Yeah. I don't know if this was a later work by Alexander or somebody else. Maybe modified it to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just can't stop looking at these uh, designs. Look, making the numbers with the shapes. It's so cool. It is very, very interesting. This one is so beautiful. I want to make abstract art. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's all I want. <laughs> I mean, me too. And and to, to the point, uh, you know, like uh, nowadays, it's even easier for, for you guys to go out and try something like this because uh, pointing out the point that with the, with the 35 millimeter camera, you can do all that kind of crazy stuff. Uh, well, what about all these flippy screens we have nowadays on digital cameras? I mean, one of my most fun things <laughs> was to uh, take photos using the EM10, the Olympus Micro Four Third camera that I rave about. <coughs> Excuse me. It's this one right here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it had a flippy screen. Mm -hmm. And you can get angles where you can't reach with your, with your face. You know, you can just point it and still compose. You can have diagonal lines on the, mm -hmm. on the screen. A lot of aid, uh, aids. For yeah. So I feel like yeah, that's maybe that's why I'm thinking that there should be a lot more uh, work like this. And there are. Yeah. There are. I've seen. I can think of a photographer right now, but I can't remember their name. It's a black and white photographer. Shoots mm -hmm. only black and white. And he does play a lot with light and shadow. Do you remember the name? I don't. He. Do you remember that photo where you? I told you uh, one of your photos that I told you reminds me of a photographer. Mm -hmm. Do you remember who he was? I know the photo you're talking about, but I don't remember the name of the person. Can anybody in the chat help me? I'm thinking <laughs> of a current photographer. I think he's from England. And he has a famous photo of a crowd, a um, bunch of people sitting around, and they're backlit by the sun. And you can see a very bright line uh, highlighting their silhouette. I'm, I'm hoping that Instagram is listening to us and will show it. <laughs> <Yeah, and add. laughs> oh, please. <laughs> it doesn't work when you want it to. No. 
here bad. again we see a, a pole jumper and very reminiscent work of the uh, line work with the abstract paintings again these photos were always there to be taken waiting for somebody to find that angle and hit that shutter yes see more with divers oh, look. the whole world is waiting for you out there to take photos of it such a beautiful composition this one <laughs> did you send me something no No, no, no. It's uh, Instagram. It's Tim yelling at me for something. He's yelling at me. Oh. Because <laughs> I reposted his story. <laughs> <laughs> Tim uh, was our first guest, by the way. If you missed that episode. Two episodes ago. Yeah. yeah. Go check it out. It was a really fun conversation. I actually uh, really enjoyed having a third person <laughs> on uh, on uh, on a podcast. <laughs> that, that would mean less of me rambling. <laughs> We should get on someone soon. As 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 soon as we have more time to prepare during the week, we should get someone on. Absolutely. So, which means not next week, probably the one after that. <laughs> um, anyways, should we? Do I you was think really that trying we, to find a photographer? I cannot find. Do you think that we sufficiently covered this topic? I think at least we. I think we gave people a glimpse on it. We we went through the work of Rodchenko, why he was such a cool artist, and uh, he he is worthy to be known and to maybe even look at his work to get inspired. Depends of of course people's taste and if they really like that kind of more abstracty and more crazy angle type of photography or not. And I think we. Oh, oh, that photo, the one you were showing. The one, this is the British Museum. Mm. One of the first photos I remember I purposely taking mm. back in the days. I was uh, in Oxford for a summer studying English back in 2007. Jeez, mm. so long ago. 2007, I went to Oxford and I for a weekend I went to London. And I remember with my small digital camera, I took a photo of that ceiling with a very specific thought of i'm gonna put it like this because these uh, structures look so cool in the photo i remember that perfectly i remember that moment when i took that photo Absolutely. and every time i go back to the british museum i think about me in that position taking the photo <laughs> so uh, when i see this photo it really reminds me of, of it yeah so i think uh, also we we went a little bit over like what the constructivism movement was and how is it looking at art in a completely different way that perhaps before or maybe even now right yeah how do how would you think that it that you can apply it now uh, i think to be honest i think you mean constructivism mm -hmm. or the idea that art is something more than just pleasing to the senses and it could be uh, useful mm -hmm. i think we're still seeing every day because advertisement is more present in us in our lives more than ever mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. and if you think about all the work of all these people that make uh, ads th videos on youtube everything all that in a way if you see that is beautiful and it appeals to you because it's beautiful is art being applied to something practical mm -hmm. right all these advertising uh, reclams that you see outside posters of course they are still used a lot and of course i think um in architecture we can still see it you mm -hmm. know like houses are functional buildings but people tend to want to make a pretty house rather than just a functional house all this is the remains and still the presence of constructivism in our life i would say mm -hmm. right yeah i i agree but i feel like it's slowly becoming more uh, consumerism rather than being uh, something that you enjoy yeah i think also it depends what the thought is behind right like i feel like maybe nowadays the people that work making advertising and so on they are more about the about the result which is do i get the click in or not rather mm. than is it gonna look nice or not yeah i mean like if you look at youtube thumbnails for example even ours you know <laughs> like a lot of them they look the same we i don't think we're doing such a good job with the thumbnails uh <laughs> personally so i'm not like i'm not saying not trying to throw any shade on anybody mm -hmm. but it's like 
that's that's one place where that can be applied mm-hmm. right and it is being applied you're using the tools you use to make let's say art pieces also to make these utilities mm-hmm. uh, that will you will use to show to people to guide them to do something else just like that uh, one where it says uh, book <laughs> uh, you know and uh, I feel like possibly to Cedric's point is that the ease, the ease of entry mm-hmm. muddies the water in a way that maybe you're, tr- you're slowly trained to like one thing, mm-hmm. you know? We notice that when you, we post th- thumbnails with people in, in, the, in the photo, they tend to get more clicks, yeah. That's let's say than something that is otherwise. That's or poor psychology. Or maybe if you say like you put a popular camera, if it's a camera review, mm-hmm. you put it in the thumbnail. Mm-hmm. Even if you have no text, nothing, you just take a photo showing it. Yeah. You will get more attention rather than if you put beautiful photos that you've taken with that camera. Yeah, because it is you. You have to. You are competing with a lot of stuff around to take the, the viewer's attention. So you have to use something that is quick, recognizable by the brain and that it means something quickly, right? Mm-hmm. In order, a photo, if it's a photo, a composed photo, it's something that is not supposed to be looked for half a second and being taken information from it, mm-hmm. right? Whereas when you put just the camera, then that's recognizable. It's something that you don't have to think more about. It's like this camera and this is it, and this is what the p- video is about. And that's why it might be more popular or get more clicks as well. So it's about functionality rather than that aesthetics, I guess. Yeah. Would you say the same applies to these posters we've seen? Um, yes and no. Because I think these posters were unique. They were something new. They were something that the public was not exposed to before they existed. So that means that they also were very attention grabbing, you know? Mm. Uh, that's how I feel. And I even feel about that now mm. because they are so like, whoa, the like use of colors, the shapes, they are something that is like, it catches your attention from the th- first millisecond that you gla- put your eyes on it. And then you maybe unfold the elements and then you read the text and stuff like that. But what, just when you look at it, there's always the main shape that means something and then there's the details in the elements inside. Mm. So you still are grabbing that first attention quickly, right? I, I At least I think so. I agree. I definitely agree because like I want to keep looking at them. <laughs> sometimes to a fault. Like Sometimes I don't even care what they say. Mm. I just enjoy looking at them. But I will definitely click on a video if the thumbnail looked anything like these. Maybe we should start making the thumbnails like old Russian propaganda. <laughs> I was thinking about that. <laughs> Do you know? Remember me telling you like I want to have all the aesthetics of the channel, like all the elements, yeah, kind of inspired by that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe we will. I don't know. Uh, Miguel is saying most posters and publication in uh, the Russian uh, uh, USSR. USSR, I would say. Uh, were quite simple and constructive. Conservative. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I can't see. Uh, conservative. Just a few of them are not typical about the contrast and colors. There were limitations on printing. Interesting. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, of course, that's. Those are details that we might not know from now. Like, unless you actually study and you know how the situation was there. So maybe they were limited to certain colors. That's why they repeat the colors. The ones primary another, ones, yeah. yeah. We we see a lot of red, but that to be expected from USSR. Yeah, so about technical, less specific, about specific colors in the posters, they had technical limitations. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But still, I think it was plenty sufficient. Like this one looks as colorful as you want. You, it to you see this one? Uh, well, we s- you saw it before. The one about that there is like red and green. Uh, <laughs> where? No, before, uh, in the other one, on the other page. This one where it has different colors? No, no, no. It was in the other page we were looking before with all the posters. Oh. 
Are you in? He's in Russia right now. All right, cool. Cool. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm uh, kind of getting uh, worried about time. <laughs> These uh, longer episodes don't seem to do as well. Uh, yeah, definitely mostly red. I mean, it was the the national mm-hmm. color, right? Yeah, it's of red and black. Yeah. Um, well, you want to jump into... Uh, I mean, we don't have to go through it so much. It's just that, uh, you know, the, they actually got someone to do a proper scientific analysis of the data as well. And I really like this picture. Yeah, that's uh, her. That's the girl, is Am- Amelia. She's the one that has done the survey and now analyzing the data and writing some articles about the data. And uh, the website is also interactive. So you can go and put in your own um, country and see what the results are in your country of the people that answered the survey. Yeah, it reminds me of this one. <laughs> yes, actually. Right? <laughs> yeah. Where is it? This one? Yeah. And this one. <laughs> Very cool. Except for there is no line here. <laughs> I really like this photo. So um, they they just go over an uh, overview. And I think the cool thing is, uh, I, as she puts it out, like that because they she's comparing the data from 2017 which was a similar very similar survey and then 2020 mm-hmm. and she's uh, analyzing you know if the trends have changed if there is more people interested in analog photography if the people are more hopeful or less hopeful about the future of analog photography mm-hmm. and overall there is a trend of optimism that the majority of people see themselves shooting as much as now or even more in the next five years which is very nice mm-hmm. Uh, also, some of the results are that the main hindrance of shooting film is the price of the uh, <laughs> roll of film, mm-hmm. which makes sense. Second one is the availability for, um, I think it was um, developing and stuff. And then the results also show that uh, more people are now involving themselves in the whole process and doing developing at home and doing a scanning at home, mm-hmm. which uh, in part she says it might be because, yeah, there is a general interest to also cut costs so that's a way to cut costs uh together with that it was 2020 people didn't have the possibility to maybe go outside and take the film somewhere they were stuck indoors they started to tinker more and get into these more crafts areas as well Mm -hmm. so uh, also there is is a younger uh, public which is interesting um she's also talking about like how you know, younger generations are getting exposed by famous people and, you know, all this thing that they contacted to got so popular. And actually, um, I, I read somewhere that the generals, the young sector are the ones that are more interested in Leica cameras, which to me is like kind of crazy because they're the most expensive and the young people don't really have the money to buy a Leica camera, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, one can hope and dream. But I think it's a bit about hype. That's what I, I think the results mean. You know, these the youngsters and they want to be in the not right trends and all the stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, look, I definitely, if I definitely think if you have the mon- the money for it, <laughs> I don't. I haven't done the uh, the financial uh, analysis on this. <laughs> I've come across a lot of different things uh, when it comes to like. Um, comparing which would be cheaper on and taking into account time and all that kind of stuff but I do think there is a there is a place for photo labs to do nice work yeah. affordably yeah I think the prices can be lower from doing it at home I think the pl- there should be some kind of deal some kind of offers there should be more of that stuff yeah, I agree, Miguel. Uh, I actually been resisting to do that because I'm, and here, here is me saying another controversial thing. <laughs> I don't necessarily like Leicas. I don't know. I just don't see the appeal of a Leica camera. He's saying that do it. Did I say what? Did I say? Did I read the comment out loud uh, for those listening? I don't know. He said, "Yeah, make a Leica video and you get hundred times the views." Yeah, the same goes for Hasselblad. I do like Hasselblad. And I kind of understand the price. Yeah. There is definitely some inflation because of popularity. But I just don't understand the price of a 
uh, Leica and it's I don't need to buy one a friend of mine does have one I develop all his film he see him like once or every once or two weeks and uh, he actually want me to take photos of him with his camera with the, yeah I mean, he want me to use the Leica M6 to do a photo shoot of him so yeah not very not looking forward for it so much because I don't know I just don't like the way it meters <laughs> I don't know it's a beautiful piece of machine machinery it's I love the sound it makes when you advance I love the shutter sound it's really nice to hold but I don't know it just doesn't make so much sense to me and Leica glass is impressive and especially when I looked on digital photos that were taken with a with a Leica mm -hmm. very impressive very impressive detail rendering with the digital Leicas but then when you're shooting film <laughs> there's a limitation which is 35 millimeter film it's still 35 millimeter it's still 35 the grain is gonna be there and your scanning options you know like i don't know if you're gonna capture any difference between a 50 nikon lens and a 50 leica lens using you know common lab scanners or a you know home scanner which yeah. was what most people are using so for me i feel like nowadays a leica is more of a fashion statement than a working photographer you know there was mm -hmm. back in the day there was a lot of photographer who used uh, these cameras but there's also a lot of photographers professional ones who work for national Ge geographic and you know when the nikon f3 and the likes of it became available leicas were not as popular anymore so if we're talking about how good a camera is I don't think Leica's film cameras are necessarily better uh, than something like a Nikon or a Canon that is the same, f uh, basically with the same format. And I have to say, you get much more functions with something like the F3. The F3 is a beast. I love that. We both love that camera so I much. I love it, yeah. And it's an amazing camera in the sense that it has, it's it's modular in a way. You get high frame rate if you use the MD4. You get uh, different options for uh, viewfinders. Mm -hmm. There's a sport viewfinder, which is basically like a screen. I don't know if you can Super see my hand, like this big, that you can see it from a distance. You don't even have to put it to your face. You can just mm -hmm. extend your arms and shoot. And the metering, the way it meters, I prefer it because it actually gives me numbers rather than two arrows that I still don't know what they mean. <laughs> and for the two arrows, just get a Jessica Electro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which like I <laughs> personally, I know it's one of your favorite cameras. I don't know. I haven't shot it enough. I still I, don't know. I want to love it. It's but a I don't beautiful know camera. It's right <laughs> over there. It's beautiful, but I dislike using it. It's just, no. <laughs> yeah, I, where is the, give me an F3 and I'll be happy. Mm. Yeah, I agree with Cedric. I, I like the HP as well. I, we have two uh, F3s, one with the HP and one without. The one with the HP on it is the P series, yeah, it's a which P is one. indestructible. Yes, and um, yeah, I mean for a fraction of the price, mm. you get a kit for a Leica body, and don't get me started on these lenses. <laughs> you know, don't even get me started. I just love f range finders. I I agree. Look, they're very nice, but remember, you, I mean, why do you love? Ra do you like the focusing mechanism? I love it yeah yeah well you know with the f3 also you can get a split prism yeah which I know, makes I it know. just as easy i know i know i don't know it's just something about range finders i i really i like them i like the focusing and i i understand i i and i do like range finders again like i love the G gw which is a range finder yeah uh, but sometimes i wish it wasn't that's why i love the fact that you can use a split prism with an slr yeah and then have all the nice things of an SLR. No, I mean, I, no I parallax, love the F3. No parallax correction. It's technically a better camera. There's no parallax correction that you need to account for. What You know, you don't need to use different frame lines on your viewfinder or even use an external viewfinder. viewfinder. different lenses, yeah. You know? I mean, it's true. If I had to choose one 35mm camera, one 35mm camera, mm. I would probably choose the F3. Absolutely. I mean, it's... And it's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. The guy and who designed it, really designed nice Ferraris and, yeah, and Lamborghinis. It. It's a beautiful piece of design. It's very nice. Very now solid. I want to go out and shoot. I know. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, 
we got excited a few weeks ago because started we started getting some sunlight <laughs> but now it's been snowing for like three days in a row it's white all over the place and dark again <laughs> uh, and i really want to uh, shoot the uh, the uh, what's it called the washi w washi w which film. is a black and white film uh, that is paper made of paper paper film paper. i mean it's 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 paper put in a film roll that then you can put on your camera yeah. and shoot it, which is really going to be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, saying the, even the uh, the price, Cedric, so Cedric's saying he got his F3 for 250 Yeah, that's Euros. about, what that's about what, how much we paid for it as well. Uh, and look, yeah, the Minoltas, they are, when I, when I said... I have a Minolta. Yeah, I like those as well. Uh, even any SLR, you know, with a good lens, is good enough for the for the purpose. All I was saying is that if you want a really good camera that does things other cameras won't be able to do, don't look at Leica's. <laughs> look at the F3 because the F3 is built and designed to do more. And uh, we were talking about the the tools in this yeah. episode that can help you do different things and i mentioned the em10 uh, i think the f3 with a sport finder will get you angles that no other camera will get you mm -hmm. and look you can get really good with um, with whatever you have you know like i've seen i've seen a um, I've, what was his name joe greer is a famous photographer or film photographer yeah, on youtube a, on instagram he's like very a, popular like a boy and he likes to shoot Leica. And m I mean, I follow his work. A lot of it is like fashion and stuff like that. Some of it I like, some of it I'm not a big fan of. But I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to talk shit. Um, it doesn't, you know, rub me off in the wrong way like Sony boys do. <laughs> but what I will say is that there was this short video where he posted on Instagram. And he was using his Leica to f take photos of uh, rodeo guys like cowboys and stuff like that and he was just like you know throwing it and taking a photo yeah a lot of these new york street photographers also they have skills like that mm -hmm. they know exactly if they put their camera in the right spot where it's gonna be how the photo is gonna look like i'm sure that it's a hit or miss a lot of times but the more you do it uh the more you know you get good at it but my question is do you need a Leica to do that? The answer is no. no. Um, is it quieter than an F3? Yes. Yeah. The F3 is much louder, shutter sound. But there are quiet cameras, I think, out there. And does it have a mirror up function? Mm, I don't know. Maybe. I have not played with the Leica. Yeah. Leica before. No, 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 no. I'm not, Leica doesn't have ah, a you mirror. Ah, you mean uh, the no, F3. No. Um, Cedric should know. Does it have a mirror up function, Cedric, the F3? Or some model of the F3? Because that possibly will make it quieter. It's, yeah. it's still bigger. But hey, what about the Minox? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Canonet is a rangefinder that is pretty small and yeah, very the quiet. Canonet is a really it's one of camera. the most quiet ones I. Yeah. And it's a 1.7. I really I mean, love it. Some variation is there's, a 1.7. Yeah, there's a 28 one, uh, but what, like a 2.8 one. And yeah. Uh, you uh, know, saying I'll stick to point and shoot for street photography. I would actually recommend you if you can get a Canonet for street photography. It's a really good it's camera. It's a really good camera and there are not so many expensive copies out there. I think you can get one for a decent price. Mm. Uh, Olympus XA, the original one, That's which is nice. kind of like inflating in price is a beautiful camera it's uh, it has a sharp lens uh, 2.8 with manual control you can't control your shutter speed which is the only bummer which one with the xa yeah that's true most of these cameras you're limited it's I either mean, aperture priority yeah. or yeah but uh, yeah the leica is going to give you that small form factor relatively small and you're going to have a lot of control what is what do you think the minox the minox is also aperture priority Mm, yeah what is the smallest camera we know of or have fully manual that is fully manual that we have or know of 
Not necessarily have. Oh, I can, I don't know. My brain is not working so well right now. Ah, uh, I know. Which one? I know. The Nikon 28Ti. Oh, that's uh, such a good one. Yeah. Don't even remind me. It is expensive. It's about $700. But it's so nice. You can find, find it cheaper, but that's a sleeper. That's a beautiful, gorgeous camera. It's so good. And it's a sleeper. There's two variations, a 2.8, uh, sorry, 28 millimeter and 35. So it's a 28 Ti or 35 Ti. Yeah. Sherry, is, uh, she has an all black Canon QL17 and an Olympus XA. We're, we're sisters, Sherry. <laughs> I, have the, I use the same camera. <laughs> yeah, she loves those two. Uh, you also, you always uh, like the XA is, doesn't leave your backpack nowadays. Yeah, it's there. I, I wish I would shoot more with it, but it's basically in the side pocket of my backpack. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would love to have a Yashica Electro 35. It looks amazing for street. Yeah, Over, it looks very overrated, nice. Overrated, bro. It, it looks nice. It does look nice, yeah. That's what you're saying. You know, uh, <laughs> I found it in Ikea one time. I used it as decoration. Yeah. It's um, cheap. It's there cheap <laughs> because there were millions of copies made. Yeah. But it's, I don't know, it has problems with the metering and... Uh, I think for for the for the size, you're better off with the Canonet. Definitely, it's yeah. smaller. It's smaller and maybe more reliable. Yeah, it works well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cherie is bringing a really really good point. Olympuses, thank you. Olympus OM. The Olympus. OM. I told you we need to get an Olympus OM now that we have a lens for it. We have a lens for it. It's one of the smallest SLRs you can find. Mm-hmm. Full. Uh, manual functions on uh, the uh, like the yeah. OMD uh, the OM1 sorry D stands for digital uh, the OM1 and that line of cameras they have all the functions that you need mm-hmm. and uh, yeah but I want I want I wanted to go back to a point I was talking about development somehow we got derailed is that look I I really understand the appeal and I think it should there should be more of it of shooting film uh-huh. and labs maybe and film companies dropping their prices look i follow a lot of my friends on social media and a lot of them like to edit their photos they like to color grade put filters on and stuff like that and one of my friends she's like a instagram model mm-hmm. and recently she took some photos with a disposable camera because, you know, film is in and stuff like that. She saw it somewhere. Probably I didn't ask her about it. Mm-hmm. I was surprised to see that she posted photos of it. And I have to be honest, they're the best looking photos, no, in profile. my opinion, on her profile. <laughs> they look really nice. They look like she took the time and edited them. Even with it's possible, they have character to them. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that she didn't do the development or scanning herself. No. Mm-hmm. She just dropped it out of lab. You know, she probably had fun using the camera because, mm-hmm. well, it's a point and shoot, a uh, disposable one, that you're, it's not going to get the most accurate viewfinder. That's like a like a fixed F8 yeah. lens or something like that, yeah. But still, the photos turn out to be good. Yeah, it is. So I think there's an appeal in shooting film in the sense that, hey, if you want to, like, take fun, cool photos, go and get buy a disposable one. Or just, you know, like, shoot film, get a... Instead of paying for the disposable every time get a cheap point and shoot from the thrift store the canon prima uh, mini 2 i mean i was surprised with the remember that photo i showed you of george in the car it looks like a decent full frame photo yeah really nice so much depth of field so much detail on a point and shoot camera was very impressive i'm looking forward to share the results with you guys i'm still shooting different films i actually want to borrow the xa Mm-hmm. And also included in the, in the test. Um, so yeah, like it's a really good thing that anybody can do, you know, to get these special photos mm-hmm. where you take them, forget about them, and now they're special because you paid for them and you got them developed and color graded at the lab. I don't know. Mi- Miguel is uh, commenting, when I had Instagram every time I either... Film is not dead. Another tax to the photos I got views and even comments. With digital, I only get family and friends. Yeah, that's what happened. Happens to me. My my Instagram right now is a mix of anything I take that I find worth sharing. I have phone photos. I have digital photos with very different cameras, and I have analog photos. The analog ones are the ones that get the most traffic for sure. Yeah. Uh, not. 
Yeah, well, Cedric is bringing up a point which I kind of agree with in the sense that uh, the reason why I started even like shooting film seriously and developing at home is because I wanted to shoot 120 film mm -hmm. uh, rather than paying for a 30 uh, a full frame digital camera. Mm -hmm. I thought the prices were very expensive. I thought that every camera was getting obsolete, you know, rather quickly. The, it, I don't think they have matured yet to the point that I with the with the amount of money that I can afford to put into it, I don't think at the time where they they matured mm -hmm. to the point that yes I can spend this much. Definitely the Hasselbloods were an attractive camera to me, but the price is insane. Yeah, I mean I I have to say I don't know if Hasselbloods are a good piece of, of yeah. equipment. Yeah, photo they for photography well they're they beautiful. Are the digital Hasselbloods. I'm talking digital. Oh okay, yeah. All right. So when I was thinking about paying for, when I, I had my D7000 and I was looking at technical photos that I want to be able to recreate, mm -hmm. I was thinking about going full frame mm -hmm. or going for a digital Hasselblad. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the digital Hasselblad was insane. Yeah, I know. Like one of my favorite portrait photographers, Annie Lebovich, she uses Hasselblad. And the photos are amazing. And so it, did, it didn't make sense to me to jump to the full frame because I wasn't working, right? You only got the full frame because you you wanted to work with it. Yeah. And actually, I started with my D70, 70D. So yeah. I started with a crop factor, but then I was like, I don't know, there's something missing something and then when i got the full frame and i got my 50 millimeter lens it was just yeah this is this is what i like i like what i see here so what happened to me is the opposite i went smaller <laughs> so i abandoned my d7000 we and went, went to the em uh, em10 micro four thirds which and like photography discord when a beginner asks for a camera i always recommend that camera and everybody else starts yelling at me you know, what are you talking about? That's the blah, 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 blah. You can, you need megapixels, you need blah, blah. You don't need any of that stuff. You don't need megapixels. Yeah, megapixels we, are overrated. Yeah, we've seen comparisons with big prints. Even the guy who printed couldn't tell the difference between a micro four thirds and a full frame camera. So yeah, there there are differences, but if you just want to learn and if you want to be able to do more stuff with your camera, get something like that. But back to Cedric's point is that for me, the 120 made sense mm -hmm. for these reasons. Yeah. I can't afford the digital hustle blood. And I want a bigger. I want yeah. a bigger a sensor, sensor mm -hmm. than. A, so I have my smaller sensor that I love to use. The one in the middle, the D7000, was completely abandoned. Yeah. So I'm either shooting micro four thirds or 120. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, because we're doing this and we want to do reviews and want to do like learn more about different films because i like i enjoy doing that yeah we're going back into point and shoots and they're growing on me <laughs> you know the 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 fact that can you imagine that i find it easier to deal with point and shoot photos in terms of editing than um digital ones from the micro four thirds <laughs> There's so much less choices because I do the preset that I decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do with all the point and shoot cameras. I'm not going to spend time on them. I'm, I just pick a look and just all of them are going to look like that. And that's, you know, that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. And you get these photos that you don't necessarily, it's always on you. The turn on time is zero. It's so on. Fast, you just yeah. click and take the photo. And it fits in my pocket, which even the Micro Four Third one doesn't fit. So basically, I have a full frame size in my jeans pocket with the um, in point and shoots, yeah. with the point and shoots, even with the XA. And I can just point and shoot and take a photo. It was whether it being street photography, whether I'm visiting my friend who had ba have babies and they're running around, and you know they're having a nice moment, and you want to take a photo of that. It's even faster than a smartphone. In terms of capturing the photo, you just pull it out and boom, yeah. take a photo. So even though I went into it thinking I'm not going to bother with 35 millimeter, 
and I don't necessarily for anything that I care about. Like I'm not gonna go be taking landscape photos mm-hmm. on a 35, but yeah, I'm using the point and shoots more than the F3. And yeah, you, it's, you know it's because again, the camera you might use the most is the one that you have all the time with you. Right. So it depends on how you look at the, f- the you know, taking your photos. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna decide that I want to shoot the Washi W mm-hmm. uh, with the paper film we talked about, um, I, first of all, I can't even load it in a in a automatic one in an automatic yeah. one because it will rip it. And I want to have control. I these I need a nice lens. The F3 is coming along. If I want to shoot some uh, ectachrome, it's going in the F3. Mm-hmm. If I want to shoot anything serious that I can't afford or even find in terms of different films uh, on 120, it's going in the F3. So that's where the F3 lives. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh any what's happening no they're just talking about uh you know he's saying yes i'm starting to think that maybe scanning and developing my own film might be a bad idea then again i need to shoot black and white (laughs) why why is it a bad idea i don't know maybe because the scanning part is a bit more difficult maybe for 35 yeah we talked about this yeah that is uh Dude, don't don't be don't be scared of trying. Like, if you spend any time doing photography and you're interested in film, go for it. It's it's look. I'm not gonna say it's easier than you think, but it's a it's a really fun learning experience, and you learn so, so much. much. Mm-hmm. You don't even know what you're gonna learn. Like, you learn you understand color balancing more, especially if you start like I did with no plugin or anything. Mm-hmm. So you have to kind of like invert the image, the um, the images using the mm-hmm. uh, the tone curves. Uh, you learn so much about how color mix. Uh, you start to notice more color cast. You start to notice more different looks, uh, different cast in the shadows, different cast in, in the highlight. Because look, you could go on YouTube or take a course where it's gonna teach you how to car- color balance. Yeah. But that's always going to have the opinions and taste and style of the teacher, mm-hmm. right? And I don't know if that's the best way to do it. I think even if you mess up and even if you buy everyone's opinion, make something that doesn't look good. If it looks good to you, that's it's what matters. Thing, yeah. And that's your that's the, be, the you know, the beginning of the thread to the line that you're going to continue with. And it's, I believe it's better to have your own than to just import something from... It's kind of like using presets. Yeah, well, if you go thing. to a color g- grading class and they te- teach you that the, bl- the, the shadows, you know, always are going to be towards blue and the highlights are always going to be towards yellow, it's kind of like you inst- put a preset on your mind. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do it that way, but I'm saying that if you want to learn and experiment and do different things, uh, the more involved you are, the more um, the more you're gonna learn, yeah. and you're gonna develop your distinct uh, style. Yeah, and you are gonna be able to see. Also, I think it's a lot the way you shoot when you then find what kind of like color gradings you like, and then you also learn what kind of shooting style will then allow you to work with those color grading in an easier way do i want to shoot with this kind of sunlight do i want to shoot with this kind of other artificial light all these you you are able to experiment and then see the results and then make what you like making yep definitely so don't be afraid uh, the only thing is that you know he say i can't i can't say i'll be able to learn how to develop in color i can't seem to find the c41 kit where i live oh can't even find it online whoa what do you mean it's all over the place. I don't know. Maybe he cannot buy it. It's in Mexico, right? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure there's a, what do you call it? The land shipping, like not over, not by airplane from the US. Yeah, or something like that. Uh, also, you can, can you can you can ship the powder stuff. From Cine Steel. Yeah. But it's international, so it might be more expensive. Yeah, of course it's. Uh, I mean, it's fine. Start with black and white. Yeah, uh, definitely. 
and digital analogy that's why i love my x pro 2 uh with a pancake lens rangefinder feeling budget that's every day i always have it on me camera uh, the, okay so yeah Cedric's saying that the mm-hmm. x pro 2 he uses it kind of like i assume like i was talking about the uh, point and shoots yeah uh, yeah or like yeah range finder feeling because it's a small and stuff it's the same way that my fuji which is not an x pro 2 is a x100s but mm-hmm. i also love it because it reminds me of this like range finder feeling very quick to like put it out and very small and everything yeah it's very simple it's uh, yeah it, it goes back to the analogy of the less things you have to the less choices you have to make is it's a very good advice for beginners for example everybody here i think knows this that as a beginner just pick one lens with one focal length mm-hmm. uh, like a prime lens basically and uh, because i mean it it eliminates the choice of a f- of a focal length it eliminates zooming yeah but it actually teaches you more about aperture because your lens is going to have two functions basically to focus and which aperture you're mm-hmm. going to take and i think if you are aspiring to be a photographer it's much more important to learn how to set your aperture than to learn how to set your focal length yeah i mean there's different aspects and everyone can also be learned independently so you take away all these variables that my mother the waters of how you learn to use a specific setting i love aperture priority it's uh, one of my favorite ways yeah of but shooting. you still understand aperture yeah yeah yeah. but i think it's because i learned so much by using aperture priority cameras because it taught me to you know like focus on the aperture what does it do how mm. does it affect my photography it's really cool yeah yeah I, th- I see miguel is trying to help so uh, in mexico know? the there's no regulations you can get the chemicals directly from websites so then you can make your own kit maybe oh, that's, yeah, that's much true. more much more complicated but it's an option i mean yeah i would totally go autochrome <laughs> i i kind of want to tease an autochrome photo uh, what was his name? Frederick? Kuhn? Kuhn? Was it Frederick? I thought it was maybe... No? Not Frederick. What was his uh, name? Erlich? Well, I'll, I'll find Kuhn. it. Otto Krum. Henrich. Henrich. I was Erlich, no. Henrich. These photographs right here. I mean, look at these beautiful colors. So nice. This guy basically made his own, um, what do you call it? Color film. Uh, it's the thing I was talking about earlier in the podcast where... Yeah, color, sir. color material. Yeah. <laughs> so you load, it's basically like a, f- a four by five camera where you load each sheet of film separately. Mm. But these are uh, plates of glass. Um, and yeah, he made them. I'm pretty sure he made his own, right? Isn't that what we were reading about it? I mean, we know someone who's trying to make their own now, as I said. Yeah. And hopefully they succeed. I'm rooting so hard. Yes. I wish I could say the name, but, you know. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, look at these colors. They're so beautiful. And uh, I've seen similar color reproduction in uh, some of the uh, crazy, crazy printing processes that exist and nobody's talking about. You mean like making colors from different uh, organic uh, materials and then putting that into different layers and stuff like that? Yeah, well, when you treat every color layer independently, uh, independently, uh, you get similar color to this. Um, It's called, what is it called? Dye, Dye transfer. Dye transfer, yeah. Dye transfer very printing. Cool. Very, very cool stuff coming your way on future episodes yes. of the Constant Agitation podcast. Yeah, Sheree, we, I think we should go too as well. We, uh, we, we got to give Eva a rest. How many meetings have you been in today? Six. Yeah, that's crazy. Plus this one. <laughs> well. It w- it's an unusual day. It's a very unusual day today. All right. Anything else we want to uh, we want to talk about? Mm, no. I, I feel bad that I have to interrupt the uh, 
like this, the conversation happening in the chat between Miguel and you know. I think they can continue talking. Yeah. There after we uh, um, finish. Uh, I think me, me Miguel is uh, in the film photography Discord. And you know also. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if if not Miguel, the link is in the description. Mm-hmm. If you're not using uh, Discord, I don't know. Film photography. It's not that. Miguel, confirm. Are you in the Discord? <laughs> 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 now we're waiting for him to get the the, the audio because of the delay mm-hmm. let's see something is happening here so trying not to interrupt it yeah no but uh, i think we cover everything that we said to talk about today and some more like always <laughs> we prepare for something and then we have more cool so miguel is in the discord you guys can uh you can keep helping you know over there I don't know if you can keep chatting if we end the stream. But I think you w- they can, but uh, probably. All right. Well, as always, thank you all for being with us. And we'll be here next week, as always. Yes. Same time, same place. Yes. Uh, hopefully more interesting stuff to come. We were, uh, we were talking about this thing. I want to mention it really quickly about uh, other topics that we want to get into. I also want you guys to, you know, be interested in talking about it. One of my friends brought up the idea that I really want enjoy listening to the podcast, but I also would like I'm not so much into photography. So maybe like bring in other stuff. Mm-hmm. So if you guys have any topics, any news, topical stuff that you want us to share, talk, talk about. about, hit us up in the questions every week. We post them mm-hmm. on Instagram. Or just DM us or write yes. to us on Discord. Uh, but we also want to keep the tradition going by at least looking at different photographers' work, different art movements, different inspirations to kind of like keep us going and remind us of these things that even if other people are nowadays working on stuff to give them more appreciation mm-hmm. to the hard and tasteful art artistic work that they're putting through Mm -hmm. and not to go unnoticed that's a beautiful way to finish (laughs) all right cool very nice well i hope you guys have a nice week next week and hope to see you next friday nice weekend yeah and see you on friday for sure enjoy the weekend bye 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 bye